Hi, Dr. Anita. Welcome to the Mary's Cup of Tea podcast. It's nice to be here. It's such an honor to have you because I read your book when I was in the depths of my recovery journey um, back in like 2016, 2017. And this is like a surreal full circle moment. <laughs> cool. That's really kind of cool, actually. <laughs> you Before we started recording, you said, I really like to dive into the meanings behind disordered eating and eating disorder. And you're like, that's what's really fun for me. And this is a selfish question, but you've been doing this for so many years, decades, right? Right. How, how do you find that it's still fun for you and not, I don't know, boring or like, what is it about it that, that keeps it fun? Yeah. Well, I, I, I love getting to the deeper meanings of things, whatever that happens to be. And I find the struggle with eating and food still so compelling because it, it allows you to kind of get a, get a glimpse, get a, um, an idea of things that normally appear to be unrelated. And when you can find connections, there's something that happens that's really fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a strange thing how something that can be so painful when you can get to a deeper meaning of it and have this aha moment, you get illumination and levity. So it's sort of like it's enlightening in both ways. You can see things more clearly, but things lighten up and it can even be funny. 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 <laughs> okay, wait, tell me how. Not, right? I, yeah, I like seeing levity in, in difficult situations because I think in recovery, everything feels so deep and dark and heavy and just not good. Um, and I think it's really healthy to sometimes like laugh at yourself, laugh at the situation. Well, it's, and I, and I tried to figure this out. Why is it fun or why is it funny? And there's something when you can, when you see something so clearly, that's what humor really is, right? If you think about what's a joke, a joke is when you're able to see connections between things that appear to be unrelated. And it makes you laugh because you would never have thought of it this way, but all of a sudden it all comes together and it's funny. I'm kind of a neuroscience geek. And so what I know now is that it's, it lights up a certain part of your brain, actually, when this happens, right? There's a part of your brain right above your right ear. It's called the anterior superior temporal gyrus. And when you find those connections, it shoots out a blast of gamma waves which is the highest electrical frequency in the brain and new neural pathways are created. And that's why we go, oh, I get it now, right? Oh, I got it now. And there's something really fun when that happens. Yeah, it reminds me of, I listened to an interview with Jerry Seinfeld and mm -hmm. uh, someone asked him the very like basic question of like, what's the secret to your humor? And he goes, pay attention. If you pay attention, everything is hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually you're using a different part of your brain. And so um, what they discovered, this was, you know, some time ago that people that had damage, brain damage in the, in their right hemisphere, they couldn't get um, sarcasm, jokes, and metaphor. And since I work in the world of metaphor, I went, oh, okay, now I'm seeing how this might work. Yeah. Well, speaking of metaphor, there's one metaphor that particularly landed with me in your book, Eating in the Light of the Moon. And there's a couple others that I'll bring up because I really want to encourage people to get this book. It's been so, so life-changing, but it's the log metaphor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Do you want me, because I have your book right here. Do you want me to read it or do you want to retell it? I'll tell it. Okay. Yes, please. It's my favorite. And the reason it's my favorite is that I still get emails from people all over the world saying this one story helped me change my perception about what was going on with me and food. And so because of that, that, that I go, okay, that's my favorite now. Uh, so of course, with these metaphors, you, you use your imagination, which again, a lot of people say, oh, I don't have a good imagination. And I like to say, what do you think worry is, right? Worry is a bad use of a good imagination, right? So, so with these metaphors, you're using this faculty 
and you imagine, you imagine yourself on the banks of a raging river and you fall in, it's pouring down rain, you slip, you fall in, you're drowning, you're getting pulled down through the rapids and along comes a big log and you grab on and that log saves your life. It keeps, keeps your head above water when surely you would have drowned. And eventually it carries you to a place in the river where the water is calm. And from there you can see the riverbank, but you can't get there because you're holding onto the log. So the irony of it is the very thing that just saved your life is now getting in the way of you going where you want to go in life. And to make it more complicated, there's always on the riverbank, someone on the riverbank yelling, let go of the log, let go of the log. And you feel <laughs> like an absolute idiot because you can't let go of the log. Yeah. The way I see it is letting go of that log may not be the best thing to do initially. Because what happens if you let go of that log, swim to shore and get halfway there and realize, oh shoot, I don't have the strength or confidence to make it. Well, now you're really sunk because that means you don't have the strength to make it back to the log either. So I believe there's this wise part of ourselves that will not, will not let us let go of anything until we're good and ready. So what do you do instead? Well, you let go of the log and you try floating. And as soon as you start to sink, you grab back on. And then you let go of the log and you practice treading water. And when you get tired, you grab back on. Then you let go of the log and you swim around it once, grab back on, twice, grab back on, 10 times, 100 times, 200 times, whatever it takes for you to have the strength and confidence to make it to shore. Then you let go of the log because you see it doesn't have a job anymore. And so I use this analogy with people who are struggling with disordered eating, because a lot of times they think that they're doing what they do with food because there's something wrong with them. They're damaged, they're broken uh, in, in some way. Um, and they don't understand that, no, whatever you're doing has a function, a very important function, and it would behoove you to find out what it is. It could very well have kept you from drowning in some strong emotional currents. In working with patients, is that generally your starting point? Because I've done a lot of therapy and uh, most therapists will go to the question of, well, how is this serving you? Or what do you think this is bringing for you right now, um, even if it's a quote unquote bad habit, every single thing we do is somehow some way serving us mm -hmm. using the tools we know, using what we have. Um, so we're all kind of always doing our best. Would you say that figuring out why you keep grabbing onto the log or perhaps like how the log has prevented you from sinking, is that a good starting place for those struggling with disordered eating and eating disorder recovery? It's a valid question. How is this serving you? Yes, I think it's important. But if you just come out and ask somebody, how is this serving you? Um, you're up against their, their defenses. There's a part of them that doesn't want to know how it's serving them, right? Because they want to just keep on doing what they're doing because they think this is what they need to do. And don't try to take that away from me. So um, that's why I use the metaphor because essentially... I like to tap into a different part of the brain and actually access a different aspect of their mind um, so that they can look at it from a different perspective. And from there, they can discover for themselves how it's serving them. So you notice in that metaphor, I don't mention disordered eating at all, not, not once, because that gives them the sp space to recognize, oh, could this be something that has helped me? And then it doesn't end there, of course, because once you, you go, okay, I kind of get it, how this has helped me, now what? Well, now there's some skills you need to learn so that you can accomplish that very same thing in a way that is more helpful and in a way that's going to get you where you want to go in life. But it's tricky if you just ask someone straight up, the chances are they're going to be pretty defensive about that for a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it almost feels like a question that's trying to be like, aha, got you, you know? Um, yeah. and, it, and it's a little blamey, right? Because yeah. um, 
they, someone who's struggling already feels like this is their fault. They're doing something wrong. And there's so much blame and shame attached to it, not just with them, but our whole culture does that. And so the thing with giving a metaphor is it kind of takes that away. It's like, well, of course you'd, who wouldn't grab on, right? Yeah. Yeah. And not to belabor the metaphor, but I just love it so much when you shared the um, lovely examples of like, you have to uh, let go of the log a little bit and float and then let go a little bit more and see if you can tread water and stay afloat and then come back to it and then let go again. And, and like you said, essentially build those skills until you're strong and confident enough to swim to shore. Are those aspects of letting go is that what you would call like a, a relapse? Like when you come back to the log or? No, I, no, I don't use that term because I don't find it useful because mm -hmm. it, it recovery is a process. You're not going to wake up one morning and go, okay, ta-da, it's done, right? It's like, it, it's a back and forth. And uh, again, maybe it's not been intentional, but I think there's some judgment that's been attached to the word relapse. It's like, oh, you screwed up. Oh, you failed. Oh, go back, back to stage one. Got to start all over again. And so there's judgment, there's discouragement. And I don't find that helpful at all in the recovery process. So that's why I say, yeah, you're going to go back to using behaviors. Of course you are. But the whole idea is that once you strengthen the part of you that can accomplish what it is you're wanting to accomplish without that, then you're going to use that less and less and less and less until it's done. And it can be done. <laughs> yeah. I, you really, okay. Speaking of that, the age old question, do you believe in like recovered, like I'm recovered or are you always in recovery specifically when it comes to struggles with food and eating? Recovered period end of story. And I know this to be true. I've been doing this for a long time. I know thousands of people that have totally, completely recovered uh, and don't struggle with food or eating in any way. And some of them are people I've known a long, long time, and I know them very well. I have very close friends. I have colleagues. I have family members. And then I get, I get emails from people from all over the world that maybe I saw 20 years ago and they just say, I want to touch base. This is my life now. The thing with food, it's over, over. Wow, I have chills. That must be so rewarding. It is. That's why I do what I do. Because yeah. what I believe, and I believe this with every fiber in my being, that those who struggle with disordered eating and get on the recovery path, they're the ones the world has been waiting for. Mm -hmm. Because what they have um, innately and then learn how to develop is an, a tremendous capacity for compassion and empathy, which is what the world really needs right now. The, the world needs more clear-minded and tender-hearted people. And in my experience, folks who struggle with eating disorders are very, very emotionally sensitive and highly intuitive. So they come by these qualities naturally. Dr. Anita, I have chills all over my body. You're giving me so much life and I know so much encouragement for the warriors out there. Um, and I'm just really, cause I'm not a professional and I feel fully recovered. And like you said, I feel that with every fiber in my being. And sometimes I second guess myself and speaking to other people because, you know, there is some, some discourse about like, you can never be fully recovered. It's always recovery and it's always a journey. And I never want to invalidate that experience. However, sometimes I feel like, well, it, I'm, I'm very fortunate that it feels possible for me. So I never want to sell out on someone else and you know just kind of buy into their impossibility when all I see and what probably you see so much is nothing but possibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and 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 I've seen the people for whom it it's over and here's the other thing that's so cool about this is that people think that what recovery is is going back to the life you had before you had disordered eating and it's so not that Recovery is stepping into a world beyond your wildest dreams. And the disordered eating struggle is simply a portal 
to greater consciousness. Because what it is you need to learn to recover is how to connect with your authentic self. And that's where the gold is, right? When you can connect with your authentic self, then you can create the life that's the right life for you, not how others think you ought to live or what others think you should do. And that's when the magic happens. And it really can be magical. Yeah. Oh, love, 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 love that. Mm -hmm. um, your professional opinion and expertise on if you consider disordered eating a type of addiction. And again, this is one of those like sticky territories because there's, um, I mean, it's a sticky topic. So uh, there's a lot of discourse around the fact that food isn't something that we could just be abstinent from. So it makes it like a very unique type of addiction. But there's a lot of people who are like, I feel addicted to food and I don't want to feel this way. So I think it's the word addiction is used in a couple of different ways and perhaps sometimes misused. What do you think of all of that? Well, there's no question that it's addictive in nature and that it can it can be obsessive and it can be compulsive. And I I think there's two parts here. What is what does it mean in terms of uh, addictive and then how do you treat it? Because in my mind, you can't treat eating disorders the way you would treat alcoholism or any other kind of substance abuse because like let's say if you're addicted to alcohol, you can drink and drink all you want, and not have a problem. If you're drinking orange juice or milk or water, the substance it, it it's a substance addiction, which is quite different. It's not the process of drinking that you're addicted to. Whereas with the eating disorders, it could be that process of restricting or binging and purging or bin binge eating or whatever. That in and of itself can be addictive, but it's a process and. Um, so it helps, though, I think, to understand if you could just zoom the lens way, way back to see, okay, what, what causes this in the first place? And the way I see it is that the cause, whatever the addiction, if you want to use that term, is, is a disconnect from authentic self. And so if you can think that we're mammals and we are born with two very powerful drives one is the drive for attachment and connection um because we're not lizards we don't just hatch out of an egg and go on our way we have to attach we have to connect to our caregivers to get fed and taken care of and so that that drive is very very strong however we're human mammals and that means we have another equally powerful drive and that's the drive for authenticity, the drive to be who you're meant to be. We're each as unique as our own thumbprint with our own um, different qualities and challenges that we come into the world with. And so um, this drive to live your uniqueness, to, to live your destiny is just as powerful. However, throughout our childhood, um, what happens is we are put in situations where there's a conflict between attachment and connection and authenticity. And when there's a conflict, guess which one wins? Attachment, right? It has to, we have to survive. And what that looks like is mommy might, uh, you, you might, little kid might say, I want a cookie. And mommy says, no, you can't have a cookie. We're having dinner in an hour. And little kid goes, I want a cookie, I want a cookie. And mommy says, if you don't cut that out right now, you're not gonna get any cookies at all. So little kid goes, okay, I don't want a cookie. Now here's an example of where the disconnect from authentic self and choosing attachment, what probably a good choice, right? We make these choices all the time. But what can happen is if over and over and over and over and over throughout your childhood, um, for one reason or another, you abandon connection with your authentic self in order to attach, we carry this pattern into adulthood, and then we continue to choose attachment over connection when really, uh, excuse me, attachment over authenticity, when really authenticity is the task for adulthood. And, but more importantly, what happens whenever you choose attachment over authenticity? It creates a tension in your being. Think of a towel twisted in two different directions. And eventually that tension becomes painful. 
And then you'll do anything to try to alleviate that pain, um, whether it's through food or alcohol or shopping or sex or whatever. So that for me is how that whole addiction starts in the first place. And that's why for me, recovery is strengthening that connection to authentic self that has either never been fully developed or has gotten frayed over time. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the reasons why so much of disordered eating starts developing during adolescence is because that's kind of where we're breaking the ties, where we are starting to use choose authenticity over attachment. Am I understanding that correctly? Right. Absolutely. That's the second go around. The first go around is around age two, which is why they call it the terrible twos, because it's terrible for mommy or daddy, because it's like the, the two-year-old's favorite word is no. I have a two-year-old grandson, so I get to see this all over again. <laughs> and and um, no, you want me to go there? No, I'm going here. You want me to eat that? No, I want to eat this. No, no, no. Because that's the very beginning where we say, no, I'm me. I'm me. I'm not you. And then that kind of goes underground a, a while. And then, as you said, it comes back up in adolescence as it's supposed to. Yeah. Well, that's what's so powerful about the way that you talk about recovery and the way you deliver your message. I mean, the subtitle of your book, Eating in the Light of the Moon, how women can transform their relationships with food through myths, metaphors, and storytelling. And I think the overarching um, approach to it is, is so spiritual. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so inspiring because I think I think spirituality can get a little woo-woo out there that not so many people grasp it or that there's not as many like tangible concrete action steps, but you're your book and your work, even the way you speak, does it in such a beautiful connect the dots kind of way and leaves people with these nuggets of wisdom that I feel, well, I did actually practice. And I feel like so many people can actually practice too. How, how do you do that? I've been accused of woo-woo, especially by my daughters over time. Oh, yeah. but, and, and, but I love those concepts. I love um, understanding that. But for me, the bottom line is, if you can't apply it, what good is it? <laughs> so there's a part of me that's quite pragmatic, as much as I really love the more esoteric concepts and can really get excited about them. It's like, okay, where does the rubber meet the road, though? How, you know, we're living in this third dimensional reality. You know, those those concepts are great, but hey, I got to I got to get to work and I got to you know, take care of my kids and I got to deal with this relationship. How, how can that be brought into play? And that's, that's the work I love doing. And I truly want to be you when I grow up, because it's this approach of like, here's the big overarching theme or topic, or I guess, um, spiritual struggle. And then here's a story to really make it make sense. And then you can use your imagination to apply the metaphor to yourself and then there's practical tools on how we can practice. And one of the um, key issues that you bring up, you have a whole chapter dedicated to it, is about power. And mm -hmm. when I first stumbled on that chapter, it almost surprised me that you didn't use the word control. Because mm -hmm. so much of what I learned about my eating disorder is that it was all about control. And you came in and you're like, no, it's about power. Mm -hmm. or not no well you didn't say anything about control but you said it's about power and that kind of just shifted the way I saw it in general so could you tell me more about that and how power plays into disordered eating as well yeah well I, I was really quite confused in the beginning because remember I started off doing this work in the early 1980s and that's what was being said back then. It's all, it's, it's all about control. And for me, the question was control of what, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, well, control over my life. It sounded, it's, it sounded too glib to me. It sounded like it didn't fully make sense. Why would you want? And so when I started looking, okay, control of what? Well, one of the things is control of emotions. Um, right? Because we've been taught, and this is a lie, by the way, we've been taught by our culture that emotions are things, 
and they're not. They're they're actual um, waves. They're waves of energy. So um, you can't control them any more than you can swim up a mountain, right? You're going to try to control your emotions. Good luck with that. But then I could see it was an attempt to control the experience of emotions and without claiming the power that comes with having emotions. I see that as a really powerful part of our inner guidance system. We need them in order to um, feel whether or not something is right for us and uh, or wrong for us. And so that's where it started taking me in the direction of it's like, well, again, authentic power comes from connection to self, right? Not, and, and we, we, again, we live in a world that doesn't teach us this. We, we're taught about the power of domination because, you know, it's like big over little, uh, strong country over weak country, rich over poor. And then a patriarchal society, males over females. I mean, it's like it goes on and on, this, this hierarchy. And it, it, it is false power. Um, and that's what the patriarchy is. It's really not about men and women so much as it is um, a power dynamic. And, and so that leads us to believe that power is like a pie. And if, if you and I are sharing a pie and my piece gets bigger, then yours is going to get smaller. If yours gets bigger, then mine gets smaller. And then that, there's a built-in competition there. And so that's sort of the kind of power plays that I saw getting played out in the struggle without this understanding. It's like, well, if you can connect with your authentic self, there's power beyond your wildest dreams. So shifting someone's concept of power seemed really important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it even shows up in, in little ways, like when we're dieting, it's all about willpower or... <laughs> When I was struggling with binge eating, it, the, I thought what would make me stop is willpower, you mm -hmm. know, and it's really kind of the opposite. It's almost like surrender is the only thing that helped me stop binge eating. Well, diets, diets are all about control and willpower. And honestly, dieting takes you in the opposite direction of recovery because its focus is on food and weight and the number on the scale. And that's not what's going to give you freedom. That's just going to give you more obsessions, more compulsions. It's, it's almost like getting caught in a net that just everywhere you twist, it ties you up even more. And so it's a hard thing for people to understand that focusing more on how you're feeling and what you want and what you don't want in other areas of your life, as well as with food, learning you know, to read your body and let your body tell you um, what to eat and when to eat and how much to eat and blah, blah, blah. Um, that is connection to authentic self. It's your body and we all are different and we all come in different sizes. And, and so, you know, um, we, we don't expect a, a St. Bernard to look like a Chihuahua, but we certainly do this with, with, you know, humanity. And so it's, it's quite a, a journey to get back to connecting to your body, connecting to your feelings, um, uh, uh, watching your thoughts, even exploring where they came from in the first place um, mm -hmm. can be helpful because it can get you to your, to your truth. How can we do that? Are there any <laughs> yeah. exercises yeah. or yeah. Things in yeah. maybe your treatment center that really yeah. make the this, difference? This is the best part of the story is that the food will take you there. So that's why trying to deny certain foods or fight with the foods when you start to understand that the food, the very foods you struggle with are talking to you and they've got the answers that you need, but you haven't let, yet learned how to listen. So I'll share right now how to do that. Okay. Again, we always begin with the imagination. So you imagine that you have two tanks. We're going to call them tank A and tank B. Mm -hmm. Fancy words. Tank A is the tank you fill when you need physical nourishment. You fill it with food. 
Tank B is the tank you fill when you need emotional or spiritual nourishment. And you fill it with things like attention, affection, appreciation, acknowledgement, meditation, prayer, and so on. But we don't know this, right? We think there's just one tank. So before we know it, tank A is full and overflowing and we're still hungry. Or we're afraid to even begin to fill tank A because it seems like a bottomless pit. And so we restrict our food. So the first task is to learn how to tease the two tanks apart. Mm -hmm. And the way you do this, interestingly enough, is to connect with your body and learn your hunger and satiety signals. And what I mean by that, the body talks to you through the language of sensation. So um, it tells us, it'll tell us uh, when we're hungry and when we're full, but it's a matter of learning to, to read those sensations. So I'll ask someone, what's the physical sensation you feel when you're hungry and where in your body do you feel it? And someone might say, oh, I get lightheaded or dizzy. Not, that's not hunger, that's famished. And what's going to happen if you wait to eat until you're famished? right? You, me, all of us, we're going to grab anything we can get our hands on. Mm -hmm. The sensation of hunger is subtle. It's a whisper, not a shout. And so there's a process of really learning to find it. Mm -hmm. I recommend people, if all they know is, is lightheaded and dizzy, okay, eat two bites of food and then ask yourself, am I still hungry? If the answer is yes, you say, well, how do I know I'm hungry? Well, I still feel kind of light, lightheaded. My stomach's growling. Okay, two more bites. And you keep going two bites at a time. So you can find that very quiet. It's either a contraction or an expansion, a heaviness, a lightness, a roughness, a smoothness, a hollowness, a density. I feel like pizza is not a hunger signal, right? It's like, it's a sensation in your body. You get to read them. And by doing this practice of two bites at a time, you can find your hunger signals and your fullness signals. Some people say, well, I know I'm full because I have to unbuckle my belt or I, I can hardly breathe. Well, that's stuffed. So we're looking for the sensation that comes before that. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of this, we're going to imagine that everybody knows their hunger and satiety signals. They got it. They nailed it. Mm -hmm. And they find themselves reaching for the pizza. And they check in, not a hunger signal in sight. No way, no how they still want to eat that pizza. <laughs> okay, guess what? Now you've tumbled down Alice in Wonderland's rabbit hole and you've landed smack dab in tank B. And in tank B, pizza's not pizza because you've entered the world of metaphor. Food isn't food. Mm -hmm. What is it? It's a concrete physical symbol Mm -hmm. of another kind of hunger that you're experiencing and may not even know about. Mm -hmm. So the question to ask then when you've landed in tank B is what's the feeling I'm trying not to feel? Because we don't eat or restrict our food for emotional reasons. We do it because we don't want to feel our emotions. So mm -hmm. you might do like a scan of your day and say, well, I'm still ticked off at the jerk who cut me off on the freeway or um, I'm worried about this upcoming parent-teacher meeting, or um, I'm annoyed at something my husband said, or I'm concerned about what's happening at work. Where is there possibly a feeling that I'm trying not to feel? Because that, that's going to mess with you. But I'm here to tell you that more often than not, the answer is going to be, mm, I don't know. I feel fine. Everything's okay, right? Because it's out of your awareness. So then the, 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 here's where it gets fun, okay? Because the food itself is going to tell you exactly what it is. But it's co the information is coded. So I'm going to show you how to crack the code mm -hmm. so that you can hear it. So it's basic, and this is general categories. We're all different. But sweet foods have to do with either feeling like there's not enough sweetness in your life or you're not sweet enough. So think about the way you might use the word sweet or, oh my gosh, she's such a sweetheart, or there's such a sweet thing to do, or, whoa, that's sweet, or I'm looking for the sweet spot. So think about that word sweet. We use it metaphorically, okay? So sweet foods, you, you look to see where you, you might not be feeling sweet enough and want to be sweeter, or there's not enough sweetness somewhere in your life. Crunchy, salty foods are usually associated with 
unexpressed anger and frustration. Ar, 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 right? You want to bite someone's head off, but you don't dare. Um, spicy foods, whether it's a craving for or fear of, is usually connected to some kind of excitement, stimulation, and change in your life. Uh, soups, stews, warm foods are typically connected to a craving for emotional warmth. And chocolate, we know this from Valentine's, right? Love, romance, sensuality, sexuality. And so if you can start to look at the very foods, they have clues for you about what's really going on. And if any of your listeners are interested, they can get a free PDF. If they go to my site, lightofthemooncafe.com forward slash C-O-T for cup of tea. <laughs> Yay, I love that. I'm going to put it in the podcast description too, so it's easily accessible for everyone. And that PDF will um, explain these this things. Whole thing. They don't have to be writing all this down. It's all written there. And, and even with a little exercise for how to walk yourself through it to find it. But just to give you an example, like, so I was working with a client who struggled with bulimia. And I said to her, I said, okay, tell me one food that you wished you could eat and have no consequences, like zero consequences. What food would that be? And she said, oh, vanilla ice cream, strawberries on top. And I said, okay, I want you to imagine I've never had vanilla ice cream and strawberries on top. And you're gonna tell me what's so fabulous about it. And she said, it's sweet, it's smooth, and it's refreshing. Now, when we took a look at what was going on in her life, her boyfriend was accusing her of not being sweet enough. She just hit a rough patch in her um, relationship with her parents and was desperate um, for things to smooth out. And she was in a dead end job in need of a refreshing change. Boom, one food was trying to tell her that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What if somebody um, is struggling with binge eating, for example, mm -hmm. and well, when, when I was binge eating, there was definitely a select few foods that I would always go for. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so I, I know how I, can, how I can personally apply this, but I know I've had some binges though, where I would just eat anything in sight. It didn't feel like I was gravitating toward anything in particular. It was just whatever I could get my hands on trying to fill that tank B with solids instead of spirits. Um, so what, how do we figure out what that is for us when we're binge eating? Well, you just said it. Okay. So I'm listening carefully to your words, solids instead of spirits, right? So right there, you had a clue that this was, these were non-physical hungers mm -hmm. and what might they be? And so if, if we were working together, I'd say, okay, what was the first one food you started off with? And then that didn't work. And then, and we would go through them and really take a look at those foods. And it's really metaphorically following the breadcrumbs. Um, you can really start, sometimes it's the foods themselves. Sometimes it's the qualities of the foods. Sometimes it's the words of the foods. So I had a client, she was an emergency room physician who struggled with binge eating. And one day she came in to our session and she was so upset with herself. Oh my God, she was so mad at herself. And she's like, can't even believe what I did. I'm so disgusted. And I said, wow, what did you do? She goes, well, I came home from work and I fixed, I was fixing dinner, uh, fixing chicken tenders for myself and my husband. And before he got home, I ate them all myself. I'm so disgusted. I can't believe it. And I said, whoa, whoa, okay, let's roll the clock back. Let's see, what were you doing? Um, you, you had worked, what, you came out of a, 12, 14 hour shift in the ER, tending to all kinds of physical and emotional trauma. And she said, right. And I said, so what do you think you were really hungry for? And she said, a hug. And I said, yeah, you, went, you needed some TLC, some tender loving care. And instead you ate the chicken tenders. <laughs> yeah. What happened is she started laughing because <laughs> it was spot on. When the metaphor is spot on, it's funny. I tell you, it's funny. <laughs> and now, so now this is only the case though, that when she's not physically hungry, if she's hungry, chicken tenders is just chicken tenders, but she knows now mm -hmm. that whenever she wants to binge on uh, chicken tenders, sh she might ask herself, do I need a hug? Do I need some TLC? Yeah. So it's, it, it can be really funny. Here's, here's another story because the, the languaging 
it's funny how we do this, but we do it. So I had a client, I was working with her remotely. She was, I think, in London and she was always late for our session. She'd come in, you know, I get a text saying, I'm on the train, I'm almost there. She'd come in, her hair is flying. And <laughs> she came in one time and she said, oh my God, I have to talk. I had, I binged and I'm so upset with myself. And I said, when did you binge? She was last night. And I went, good, because the closer it is, to when you had the binge, the easier it is to, to sort this down. So I said, okay, so um, what did you what did you binge on? She goes, I'm really embarrassed to say this because I always, when I binge, I just put ketchup on everything. And I said, okay. So what, what was going on that day? Was it stressful? And she goes, oh my God, it was so stressful. The company she worked for was having like a crowdfunding and um, they had a goal that had to be met. And if they didn't meet it, they, the company would fold. I went, okay, that's really stressful. I said, did you meet your goal? And she said, no, you know, she said, no, she said, yes, we met the goal. And I said, oh, okay. So um, then did, did you celebrate as a company? You met the goal? She goes, no, our boss said, okay, we've so far behind already. Now we got to just go catch up on all the other stuff. I went, catch up. <laughs> I love that. And her life was one she was always catching up. Yeah. And so she was, we were able to look at, at that and what that really meant for her. And um, I did get an email from her. I think she's now living in Brazil and her life is totally different. And she's not trying to catch up all the time. Yeah. So maybe a lot of her spiritual practice was about slowing down and yeah, absolutely uh, feeling appreciated and celebrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you what my binge foods were? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I had a huge, well, besides eating everything in sight, uh, the biggest thing I always turned to was like nuts and nut butters, which I later researched that a lot of that has to do with like hormonal regulation and like the physical fats. Um, but also mm -hmm. I was absolutely addicted to making myself greek yogurt parfaits and it would be yogurt and nuts and all kinds of nut butters and fruit like so many raspberries and i know this sounds like quote unquote healthy but when you're eating tubs and tubs yeah. and tubs of greek yogurt and tubs and tubs and tubs of peanut butter it was definitely like my go-to binge thing um and i've always like i don't know i think a lot of it is the fatty foods like greek yogurt nuts nut butters um but i always now that you're talking in this way I'm wondering what it could have been yes yeah, so let's look okay so um, I want you to just describe to me the experience of eating this this uh, parfait that you would create okay what's, so we know there's Greek yogurt what's in it yeah like the roasted the Costco roasted nuts um that were roasted not necessarily salted because I felt like they were already salty enough um, they were crunchy and combined with raspberries. It was like the perfect level of tang and salty, um, a little sweet, although I don't like too, too sweet, but really it was like, like a parfait. I feel like, and it's funny because now I do not like yogurt parfaits that much every so often, but back then it was like my treat. Like it was like eating ice cream. <laughs> it felt better than ice cream because it just felt more well-rounded, I guess. Like I got all the flavor profiles and all the textures from it. And then cereal, cereal was also a big thing. Same thing, sweet, okay. salty, crunchy, cold, milky. So let's go back to this parfait, okay? So you said the the um, roasted nuts that are, they're already salty enough. You like the crunch, the raspberries brought in, the per uh, perfect tang um, and, and, uh, it was not too, too sweet and well-rounded. And what was it with the yogurt? Why the Greek yogurt? I don't know. It was like yogurt. I, I just have very positive associations with yogurt because when my mom was pregnant with my baby sister, that was her pregnancy food. And she made her own yogurt. She got a yogurt machine and she would make all this yogurt. And there were times where this is when I first started exhibiting signs of disordered eating. There were times when mom left yogurt in the yogurt maker, went off to work. I came home from school early and I would eat all the yogurt and not leave her poor pregnant. Yeah. Self. 
Bingo. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at this because if 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 I were you, one of the things I want to look at, and and one of the things that is really a big part of uh, disordered eating is working with the concept of mothering. And it's not the same as biological mother, but mothering as an archetypal energy, which is nurture, soothing, and comfort and support. Mm -hmm. We, we, it's not gender related. Um, You can get mothering from your dog. You can get it from your husband. You can get it from mother nature, which is why we don't, we don't say father nature. We say mother nature. What's that about? Right. But so right here, you have the yogurt for you is connected profoundly to mother Ing. Mm-hmm. So if I were you and I had had a big binge on a parfait, I'd want to look at where at that point in time I was needed, needing to be comforted and soothed. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, and that things were already kind of um, rough enough that's the salty um, and the and the crunch. There's some frustration around how rough things have been. You don't want things wet too too sweet, but you do want things more well rounded. Mm-hmm. That's what I would look at in those instances when yeah. you're having that urge for that parfait. Does that's that so cool. hit? Yeah. I ne- I never realized how much that yogurt was like this. Yeah. It was this bond I had with my mom and she was yeah. my sister. It was like the best thing that ever happened to me, definitely being home. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's weird to say yogurt's your comfort food, but that's yeah. what it was. But listen to you, right? Listen to how you describe it. It really are the the food carries a lot of this um information for us. And and if you were just to go say, okay no more yogurt for me. You would never get to this understanding about how important that is for you. Mm -hmm. Those connections. Yeah, that's really profound. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Thanks for letting me. (laughs) Thanks for being brave enough to volunteer your food (laughs) so we can play with it. Yeah, I have a, um, to wrap up, I have a selfish slash personal question for you. Um, I think this conversation has just been Uh, incredibly eye-opening for me, for our listeners. And I want to tie it back to you personally um, and ask you like how perhaps your relationship with your body, with food, with yourself, what have you learned about yourself through having a residential treatment program? I know it's, it's in Hawaii and there's this island aspect of it which I can imagine is is very beautiful and you're also from Guam originally Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so islands are a big part of your life but I want to know a little bit more about you and sorry I'm the CEO of tenfold questions um particularly I think as a young person I recently have been enjoying positive conversations about getting older and how much beauty is in is in store in other areas of our life outside of our 20s and 30s that everybody talks about so much so the wisdom over the years and also watching your own body change I just want to know more about you (laughs) okay well um I'm fascinated by all of this as as you know and everything changes So the question is, how can you um, relate to those changes in a way that continues to be exciting? So the key quality, I think, is to carry curiosity. And I I recently created a a self-study course that I do have online at Light of the Moon Cafe um, about the four phases of the feminine and how we embody it. And the four phases, I take the terms from fairy tales, the maiden, the mother, the queen, and the crone. And in fairy tales, there's mostly the maiden, the mother, and the crone. But nowadays, people live past 50. So I thought, ooh, there's a new archetype because I was feeling it in myself. And that's the queen. So I I think for myself, (laughs) aging is such a trip. I mean, it's you really have to stay conscious and alert to the messages that you get from the culture. This is one of the skills, by the way, that someone uh, recovering from an eating disorder can apply for the rest of their lives because there's so much body image stuff 
not simply around being young, but also about being old. Um, and, and those of us that are fortunate, we're going to discover that gravity is a real thing, <laughs> right? If you live long enough, you know, there's this pull. And it's, so the, the, always the question is not um, to fight what is. And Byron Katie says, you fight reality, reality always wins. But how, you, how do you want to respond to it? And so I think for myself, one of the things I began to realize is that as I got older, I had to have new rules for myself. And when I say rules, I really mean guidelines. I'm not, you know, that I try to follow. And so every year I'd have a new healthcare, healthcare um, rule. And, and for me, healthcare is not like just a super serious thing. It also means like getting regular massages and uh, dancing every morning when I can and not dancing if as like today my foot hurts I wanted to dance but I went no need to not today you can't dance your foot hurts um so this this really deeper connection to self but the cool thing that happens as you get older you do stop caring so much about what other people think um, that starts to erode. And um, if you allow it, connection to spiritual, non-visible, non-physical things grows because you begin to perceive them and appreciate them in other ways. So for example, um, I loved being very physical when I was younger. Uh, I still appreciate physicality, but I don't get to express it in the same way. Uh, the things that I did when I was younger, I would hurt myself <laughs> while I'm older. And so it's a matter of like accepting that and saying, okay, now what? Um, likewise, I feel like my capacity to be still or to think more deeply has grown exponentially with age. And so that's really one of the coolest things. And um, what a lot of people, this is one of the big myths that a lot of people don't know is that even your sexuality gets better in a whole different way. It's really something to look forward to. Yeah, um, this is such an interesting fun fact, but a couple of months ago, my fiance and I were on a road trip. And I don't know if you've heard of the Dear Sugars podcast, one of yes. the hosts, yeah, one of the hosts is Cheryl Strayed, who's mm -hmm. the author of Wild and Tiny Beautiful Things and uh, a big writing role model of mine. And we listened to a podcast episode she did on sex and aging. Oh. And it is these experiences of <clears throat> people in their 60s, 70s and 80s and what sex is like when you're yeah. older. Yeah. Um, it's something we're not exposed to. And then I can imagine it's kind of I don't know, lonely, trying to figure it all out. <laughs> well, one of my favorite things uh, is I would do these workshops on the four faces of the feminine, which now it's all online because I haven't been traveling the same way. Thank you, COVID. But um, one of my favorite things to do is I would do these women's circles and divide the women into two groups, women over 50 and women under 50, and they'd be facing each other. And the women over 50 got to be the queen's council. And they, the younger women got to ask them anything they wanted. And um, because there was a whole row of women, no one was ever put on the spot. And the older women got to tell the younger women what they know now that they had wished they had known when they were younger. And so it would be a lot of different topics, everything from finances to relationships, but it always got to sex, always went to sex. And what these women had to say was mind blowing. It was so um, incredible. And, and, and the younger women were sitting there with their jaws on the floor because it was just awesome. They, they, they would never get to hear this otherwise. And one of the most common things that I heard, because I did this many times, a, a common theme was almost always one of the older women said, what I know now that I didn't know then is that I get to set the pace. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that, mm -hmm. that, that as you get older, you learn some things. <laughs> oh, Dr. Anita, I look up to you so much. You're such a light in your spirit and your 
wordsmithing and all the wisdom that you offer. Just thank you so, so much. Um, for those who want to join your course, I will definitely link it in the description. Is there any other last minute notes that you'd like to share with our listeners before we farewell? I just want to kind of underline that anyone for anyone that's struggling with eating, total complete recovery is possible. And um, I'm here to cheer you on because I meant it when I said, you're who the world is waiting for. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much.